Good afternoon, and welcome to the second Harvard Horizon Symposium. The first one was held last year on May 6. The next day, I received an email from, from Professor Leah Price of the English department, who was the ad thesis advisor of one of the inaugural Horizon scholar, Liz Ming uh, um, Ami Amizadi. Sorry, Liz, I know you're in the audience somewhere. I hope I've properly uh, butchered your name. I've been practicing. Um, with Professor Price's permission, I quote, your inbox must be clogged with fan letters right now, but I wanted to add one more by saying how stimulated, absorbed, and frankly moved I was by last night's events. This was one of the most intellectual intense events I have ever seen at Harvard, unquote. I was particularly pleased to see the phrase intellectually intense because one of the primary motives to launch Harvard Horizon was to showcase the unparalleled intellectual vibrance across the PhD landscape at Harvard. Professor Price continued, as I quote, as you know by now, Liz's dissertation identifies the form of writing the novelist invented in order to make complex societies comprehensible. The Horizon training taught her to do the same thing analogous. To find a ways to speaking that, to find a ways of speaking that would make complex arguments comprehensible. Over the past months, I've seen the process make the dissertation itself richer as well as clear. I hope all students and the faculty can someday be helped to work on their, way, their, their own ideas this way." Unquote. Again, I could not be more pleased to hear this unsolicited testimony that no, not only Horizon training improved the scholars' presentation skills, but more importantly, it helped to enrich their research. That was indeed another important motive to create Harvard Horizons, to demonstrate that great communication skills not only can be ac acquired, but the process of acquiring such skill can greatly benefit the research itself. As most of us have experienced, the shorter a talk, the deeper the understanding it requires in order to deliver it most effectively. As a matter of fact, the five minutes presentation you're about to hear by the eight Horizon scholars this year are the results of at least 10 weeks of intensive work. Professor Price concluded her email with, as I quote, that's already beyond my allotted five minutes, but just wanted to send my warm thanks for the difference you have made to our graduate students, unquote. As much as this compliment inflated my ego, <laughs> having been a dean f now for almost two years, I know too well that if a dean can claim to have single-handedly made a difference, it is most likely a difference in the wrong direction. <laughs> so the you, Professor Price email really is directed in the Professor uh, Price email, really is directed to an entire team. I mu must first thank Professor Hisa Kuriyama of Eastern Asian Languages and Civilizations for his grand vision that started Harvard Horizons. I cannot thank enough the Horizon training team led by Professor Laura Fromm of Visual and Environmental Studies and by Pamela Pollock of the Box Center, as well as Marlon Kuzmik, also of the Box Center, for the beautiful media preparation and documentation. Harvard Horizons could not have could not have succeeded without the tremendous support of the Bach Center and the leadership of Professor Rob Liu. Indeed, Rob and I are currently discussing how to extend the horizon of Harvard Horizons itself in order to benefit many more students. So stay tuned. There are so many people to thank, including a GSS team led by the permanent dean of GSS, Margaret Gill. But since I cannot allow myself to exceed five minutes. Let me conclude my remarks by thanking the entire Harvard Horizon Faculty Selection Com Committee for its tireless work and to invite a member of the committee, that is Provost, Provost Alan Garber, to demonstrate how to give a powerful speech in five or perhaps even in three minutes. Alan. Thank you, Shali. Welcome, everyone. Who is the scholar of the 21st century? That's a question that's asked every day, often implicitly in some way, in GSAS. 
which prepares its graduates to lead. It's preparing its graduates to lead at a time when the expectations of scholarship, and in particularly scholarly leadership, are changing. Much of what we face today in academia is unchanged. You, the academic leaders of tomorrow, the scholars of tomorrow, are expected to have a deep command of your discipline, and you're expected to be able to convey the importance of the field. Communication has never been more important than it is today, and how we communicate is changing. Many of you will have your lectures viewed on devices that we all hold in our pockets. That's the world beginning today and increasingly the world of tomorrow. There is less deference to authority and to credentials, and we can no longer take it for granted that our views will be uh, valued simply because we have mastered a field. To be valued, it's necessary to be understood. To be understood, it's necessary to be heard. And to be heard, it is necessary to reach the audiences of today. That means that our modes of communication may need to be developed to better ensure that the results of our work are heard and understood. Harvard Horizons is a bold step in that direction. Today's speakers were chosen from a highly competitive process. Many impressive students presented their work before the committee. Many more could have been chosen to present here today. And I would guess that many people who did not apply to be uh, in Harvard Horizons would have been capable of doing very well. But the students that we selected exemplify what GSAS stands for, deep understanding, intellectual curiosity, a deep and fearless spirit of inquiry, and a spirit of innovation. Although we celebrate the accomplishments of the students you will hear from today, you should also see them as representative of the kinds of exciting work and promising scholars that characterize the GSAS. Short presentations of this kind, as stimulating as they may be, are not about to replace the lecture or the seminar. But I hope you will find the talks to be engaging and recognize that the skills you will see demonstrated today are the kinds of skills that will be valuable tomorrow as our students convey the, their enthusiasm for research and demonstrate how we together can prepare them to be more effective scholars, teachers, and communicators. Today's presentations will help you see why we are so proud of our PhD students and the faculty and staff who support them. I'd like to thank Hisa for his vision and also thank Shao Li for his. Uh, many of us believe deeply that the kinds of changes that this program represents, the kind of boldness it represents, is what will position our students to be the most effective leaders of scholarship for tomorrow. Welcome and enjoy. Thank you very much, Alan. That was three minutes, 20, 80 seconds. I was <laughs> clocking it. About a month ago, I had the honor of introducing President Drew Faust to a group of students from other institutions. I started by telling them that at the time I was appointed as a dean, I was reminded by an ex-dean that Harvard has 128 deans. The sublimal message obvious being, don't take yourself too seriously. <laughs> you are replaceable. <laughs> I told the student that, but Harvard only has one president. And she's truly irreplaceable, not only because of who he, she is, but also because of her powerful vision, One Harvard. Harvard Horizon symbolizes beautifully the One Harvard vision because it provides a platform for intellectual dialogues and engagement by PhD students from the entire university. It is therefore extremely fitting, and I'm very grateful that President Faust is here today to kick off this symposium. Let's welcome President Faust. Thank you, Jali. It's nice to be the one and only. 
and it's a tremendous pleasure to be here to celebrate the accomplishments of these eight remarkable graduate students. I join Professor Garber in congratulating every one of you. The Graduate School of Arts and Sciences represents the highest aspirations of higher education. Among them, the pursuit of unfettered truth and the purest distillation of scholarship. Each day, graduate students develop new ideas, deepen understanding, advance discovery. These are women and men who represent the future of knowledge and indeed the future of universities. The boundaries between fields are becoming more and more flexible, creating new avenues of inquiry and reshaping the familiar frontiers of knowledge. Communicating about one's work outside of one's discipline and embracing opportunities to collaborate are essential skills for researchers and scholars in the 21st century. This year's Horizon Scholars will demonstrate that they have mastered the art of describing and explaining the importance of their work. They will share ideas that push the boundaries of what is known, ideas that connect cultures and disciplines. And they will convey new insights and new ways of thinking with approaches that are energizing and thought-provoking. When I welcome graduate students to the university each fall, and maybe I welcomed some of you in this room a number of years ago, I speak about how Harvard confronts us with the very highest expectations, how it redefines our aspirations by helping us understand how very much we must ask of ourselves. This symposium is a showcase of ambitious aspirations realized. And I am so pleased to be here with all of you to celebrate the GSAS and our graduate students. And now to tell us more about each scholar, Professor Hisha Kuriyama. <clears throat> Welcome. Are you all ready? So it's my great privilege and pleasure to present the Harvard Horizon Scholars for 2014. There they are. What more can I say? Just look at them. <laughs> you can see that they're creative and passionate. Yes, creative, passionate. Um, brilliant and dashing, and engaged in the most thrilling intellectual ventures. Just like you, and you, and you. My point is that these are truly extraordinary researchers in their particular disciplines. But also representatives of the boundless creativity uh, found across the graduate school. So that Harvard Horizons is at once a celebration both of individual in uh, innovation and of the intellectual vibrancy of the entire Harvard community. Now, before we begin, let me just conclude by reminding you that even if you are as brilliant and dashing as our scholars are, it can be a tad nerve-wracking to stand on the stage for the first time in Sanders Theater. And so I'd like to urge you to give our scholars an enthusiastic ovation as I now introduce them individually. So I'm going in, in the order uh, with, um, in which these speakers will be presenting today. David Roberson, Neuroscience. <laughs> Heather Owens, Organismic and Evolutionary Biology. <laughs> D 
Danny Orbach, History. Thomas Norman, Systems Biology. Whitney Henry, Biological and Biomedical Sciences. Adam Anderson, Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations. AJ Kumar, Applied Physics. And Sarah McGregor Rugheimer, Astronomy. And so, without further ado, we will proceed to the first presentation by David Roberson. Thank you all for coming. It's great to see such a great turnout. Um, so I'm an MD, PhD student, and my job is to use science to advance medicine. And I really love what I do. And that can actually create some awkward moments. Let me explain. Whenever I meet someone new and they ask what I do, I have a hard time containing my enthusiasm. And when you study pain, it can create some awkward moments. So it, when I start talking about pain with a big grin on my face, <laughs> it throws people off. And the response I get is often awkward silence or confusion. And that's understandable because pain is no laughing matter. But there are really exciting things happening in pain neurobiology. And I'm happy to share my part. So my interest in pain began during my first year of medical school when my mom and stepfather were involved in an airplane crash. They were critically injured, but made a remarkable recovery and are here in the audience today. But their, their painful recovery revealed to me that safe and effective treatments for severe and chronic pain do not exist. What they needed for their pain was a magic bullet, a drug that affects its target without unwanted side effects. So for my PhD work, I joined Clifford Wolf's lab at Boston Children's Hospital, looking for a magic bullet for pain. When you're in pain, nothing else matters. C.S. Lewis put it this way, Pain insists upon being attended to. So perhaps it's no wonder that pain is the main reason that people go to the doctor worldwide. And pain is also a huge economic burden. The cost of pain to the US economy is over $600 billion every single year. That's more than the cost of cancer, heart disease, and diabetes combined. There's got to be a better way, a smarter way to treat pain. Current drugs that treat pain like Tylenol and morphine don't work that well for people with chronic or severe pain. In fact, doctors typically have to treat three patients with these drugs before finding one who reports even a 50% reduction in their pain. Never mind that opioid drugs like morphine cause devastating addiction. Now there is one drug that can stop pain signals before the brain ever perceives them, local anesthetics. These drugs, like lidocaine, are the numbing agents used for dental procedures. 
In order for local anesthetics to block nerve signals, they must first enter the nerve fiber. The signals here are represented by pulses of light. But for the local anesthetics to enter the nerve fiber, they first must pass through the membrane to block the signal from inside the nerve. The problem is that they enter all the nerves at once, causing numbness and paralysis in the area treated. And since local anesthetics pass out of the nerve as quickly as they get in, the signals soon return along with the pain. So my research has revealed a way to use a, a new type of local anesthetic to block nerves in an activity-dependent way. So this means that only active pain nerves are blocked without causing numbness or paralysis. For example, if this drug were used during surgery, the surgical pain would be blocked for 24 hours or more. But the protective role of pain in your body would not be harmed, the, the protective role would be preserved. And that's because if you had an injury elsewhere in your body, you would still feel pain there, even though the pain at your surgical site would be blocked for 24 hours or more. Here's how we did it. So starting with a, a local anesthetic like lidocaine, an electrical charge is added to create a permanently charged form of lidocaine. This electrical charge is key. Positively charged molecules cannot enter the nerve fiber membrane, so positively charged lidocaine would not have any effect because it cannot get inside the nerve to block the signal. It would not cause numbness, it would not cause paralysis, and really it would have no sensory effect at all. But if this cannot get in the nerve on its own, then how could it possibly any, be any good for treating pain? Well, what we did is we used pain, we used neurobiology as a drug delivery device. It turns out that pain nerves have a unique set of receptors that open to form a channel whenever pain is present. These channels allow charged molecules in. So by using a charged form of lidocaine, we can deliver the nerve blocking agent only to active pain nerves without causing numbness or paralysis because the nearby nerves are not affected. Now this is great, it's tremendous to have a, a better treatment for pain, but there is one more thing I want to tell you about. There are a lot of similarities between pain and itch. For one, the same receptor channels that are present on pain nerves are also on itch sensing nerves, but the similarities do not end there. Chronic itch is as debilitating as chronic pain. And for most people with chronic itch, nothing helps. Steroid drugs can be used for some people with uh, chronic itch, but it does not work for most. Doctors typically have to treat six patients with chronic itch using these steroid drugs before finding one who reports a 50% reduction in their itch symptoms but charged local anesthetics work great for blocking itch. And importantly, they block the types of itch that are currently impossible to treat. So we're excited, and these are a few of the applications that we think charged local anesthetics may be good for. We're currently developing this technology and optimizing it with hopes of beginning clinical trials within the next two years. It's my hope that by using science to advance medicine, we can relieve some of the pain and itch that's suffered daily by billions of people worldwide. And who knows, maybe this breakthrough will one day help you or someone you love. Thank you. Hi, thank you, it's great to be here. Have you guys been enjoying the sun the last few days? Of course you have. We tend to have a very sun-centered view of the world. It's understandable. 
We are solar powered. Plants photosynthesize, they turn the sun's energy into sugars, they become food for animals, which can become food for other animals. It's the circle of life story that we're all intimately familiar with. Today I'd like to tell you a different story and hopefully make you just a little bit less sun-centric in the process. So let's go on a field trip to the deep sea where there's no sunlight ever. I'd like to show you one of my study sites. Now, our destination is about a mile and a half deep, only accessible by submersible vehicle. This is the famous sub, the Alvin, that I've been lucky enough to use in my own research. Now, the trip to the bottom takes about two hours, and it's cold and claustrophobic and cramped and totally worth it. <laughs> Um, when we get down to the bottom, we see that the sea floor is relatively barren. Animals are few and far between, and that makes sense in the near absence of solar energy. But let's look around a little bit more. I want to show you my favorite environment on the planet, hydrothermal vents. So this is an underwater volcano called a hydrothermal vent, and you can see that it's covered with worms and other living things. And this is far more biomass than could possibly be supported by energy from the sun. When biologists first saw these communities in the 70s, they immediately realized they had to have a totally different energy source. And this shattered that fundamental assumption that all living things were dependent on the sun's energy. It turns out these animals are dependent on microscopic organisms or microbes that can, in these environments, can grow in such densities that you can see them with the naked eye. But what powers these microbes? It's actually chemicals that come out of these volcanoes. So what looks like black smoke is hydrothermal fluid, and it's chock full of chemicals from deep inside the earth that these microbes use the way that you and I use oxygen and food. And the process of powering life through chemical energy is called chemosynthesis instead of photosynthesis, kind of like using a battery instead of a solar panel. So, Chemosynthesis enables these amazing biological communities to be distributed globally. Each red dot represents a vent field that scientists have visited and studied. And each yellow dot represents a vent field that we have evidence for but have yet to see with our own eyes. Now that's a lot of yellow, right? So even though we've been studying these environments for a few decades now, there are still a lot of really big questions left to answer and some fundamental questions about this chemosynthesis process. So when I started graduate school, I was really curious about how fast chemosynthesis happens in these hydrothermal vents and about what environmental factors make that process happen faster or slower. So we went out to sea and we used the sub Alvin and we collected samples from the sea floor, processed them on board the ship, and we conducted shipboard experiments to measure these rates and determine how fast chemosynthesis happens at different temperatures, temperatures that we would find in these environments. Now, our results actually surprised us. We expected to see something like this, where rates would increase with temperature, more chemosynthesis as it got hot, to a point, and then drop off as temperatures became too hot for those organisms. And this is a pattern that's really typical of most biological reactions. So we were surprised when instead we found the highest rates of chemosynthesis at low temperature, seawater temperature. And that really got us thinking about the importance of these low temperature environments at high temperature hydrothermal vents. Uh, and these are low temperature environments that are easy to overlook when we're focused on these captivating chimneys. So this is one of those chimneys and you can see that it's surrounded by white patches on the sea floor. And those white patches are low temperature venting environments. And most of that white is microbes that are probably doing a lot of chemosynthesis. Now I still have a lot of work to do. That's actually my uh, next project deployed on the sea floor. But I studied these microbes to better understand how geological, chemical, and biological factors can influence each other in these amazing environments environments that we know so little about and have so much to teach us. So what might we expect to learn from hydrothermal vents in the future? Quite a lot, actually. For better or worse, many of these vent structures sit on top of massive mineral deposits that represent potentially valuable future sources of rare metals that we need for our technological society. 
Organisms that live in these environments have unique adaptations to high temperatures and toxic chemicals that could potentially provide us with valuable medicines in the future. Hydrothermal fluids regulate aspects of global ocean chemistry, but scientists are still figuring out the precise nature of that regulation. Additionally, hydrothermal vents may be able to teach us something about our own origins. There's some evidence that the first life on Earth evolved at a hydrothermal vent. And finally, if there is life in our solar system beyond Earth, maybe on those icy moons of Saturn and Jupiter, it's probably not photosynthetic. It's probably much more similar to the microbes that I study, at least in terms of its energy source. So the next time you're outside enjoying a beautiful sunny day, I hope that you can stop and close your eyes for just a minute and think about these oases in the cold, dark, deep sea, and think about the light that they can shed on life up here in the sun. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's so nice to see you guys sitting so obediently in your seats. It's a truly a specious beginning of a talk about disobedience and rebellion. <laughs> so let us travel back in time. The Imperial Japanese Army was one of the most formidable enemies that this nation has ever faced, certainly in the Second World War. As part of the legacy of this war, this army is often being perceived as a bastion of blind obedience to authority. Its soldiers, as you can see here, are often denigrated as blind, faultless, and obedient robots. Like with any myth, there is some truth in it. Japanese soldiers were indeed trained to follow every order given by superior officer, even rushing to their death in front of machine gun fire, or taking their own life rather than falling into captivity. But that was just a small part of a much more complicated picture. As I will show you today, politically speaking, the Japanese army was one of the most disobedient armies in the world. And let me give you one example. In 1931, a military terror organization called the Cherry Blossom Society attempted to wipe out the entire Japanese cabinet with naval bomber planes, poisonous gas, and machine gun fire. What was their punishment, do you think? 25 days of confinement to an inn. <laughs> Guys, I received more severe punishments as a soldier in the army, and I didn't murder anyone, mind you. <laughs> but in Japan of the 1930s, rebellion was almost no news. Ministers, prime ministers, businessmen, generals, court officials, and other dignitaries were murdered almost on an annual, sometimes on a monthly basis. And guess what? The officers who perpetrated such outrages were often left unpunished or punished very leniently. And this had worldwide political significance. Government by assassination, thus an eminent American journalist described the Japanese regime at the time. The army has swept aside a series of terrified civilian cabinets, leading the nation into militarism, dictatorship, and finally into the Second World War and total destruction. How and why did it happen? That's just the question my research sets to explore. And I would argue that that was an unintended combined result of three disconnected decisions. Bear with me here. 
The first one was the basic character of the Japanese regime. Modern Japan was founded in 1868 by competing factions. These factions had used the emperor, this guy that you see here, as a symbol to unify them. But the emperor, absolute in theory, was in fact an empty political center. He was a child. He couldn't really give orders or form government policy. What actually happened was that imperial edicts were drafted by all sorts of ministers and advisors around the throne. Then rebellious politicians, disgruntled ministers, and other unsatisfied elements could always say, hey, 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 wait, government policy? That's not the decision of his imperial majesty. That's just the treacherous advisors around the throne. Others, after several rebellions were launched in the name of the emperor, a second decision was made. In order to prevent politicians getting hold of army units, the army was directly linked to the empty imperial center, to the emperor. And then, yet, there was another unintended result. The generals could form their own independent foreign policy, could ignore the civilian government, using the name and the prestige of the emperor as an excuse. And the emperor didn't really speak, did not really give orders. But this political agency in the beginning was limited to a small group of older, experienced people, mostly responsible. They didn't want to rock the boat and did not want to use violence against other Japanese. But then the fair decision came into the picture. The Japan had led several wars on the continent in the end of the 19th century, in China and then in Russia. Because Japan was a poor country and did not have the resources to lead a prolonged war, the war said to be quick and decisive. And for order for wars to be quick and decisive, Young officers had to get a lot of tactical discretion in the field because they're on the ground, they know what to do best. And then there was yet a third unintended result. The young officers had seen their seniors, the top generals, disobeying the civilian cabinet in the name of the emperor. And they thought to themselves, hey, couldn't we use the name of the emperor to disobey the generals? So instead of taking tactical decisions, young officers began to take strategic decisions on the ground. For example, assassinating foreign leaders to solve military problems. The Queen of Korea was assassinated in 1895 by a group of officers. Then it happened yet again in China. And if it was okay to murder foreign leaders, why not to assassinate Japanese leaders as well? And generals, the army and the civilian cabinet had quickly deteriorated into a brutal factional war of all against all. This, as we had seen, was a result of his three disconnected decisions. Each and every one of his decisions was rational. Each and every one of them was set and designed to solve a specific problem. Each and every one of them was designed to maintain order. Together, they created a mutation, a monster, a culture of disobedience, rebellion, and chaos. And this chaos spread like a contagious disease from top down to the civilian and military apparatus. And when the government had finally realized what happened, when the government had finally realized that the army went out of control and the Japanese body politics is sick to the death, it was already too late to do anything about it. Thank you very much.
Thanks, everybody. Have you ever looked at a really zoomed in photo on your computer? It just looks like random noise, right? But if we could zoom out and look from a different perspective, we'd see patterns emerge that we can't see up close. What looked like random noise before now makes sense. But I want to introduce you to noise in a very different context noise inside your cells. In order to show you what I mean, I'm going to have to take you on a trip to a bit of a funny place. Actually, we're going to travel inside my nose. Bear with me here. So, we're going to travel from this stage all the way down to the level of individual cells inside my nose. Now, here we are. Look around. Be amazed. The nose is actually a pretty amazing thing. It can sense about a thousand distinct odors. What you might not realize is that each of those odors. They're actually detected by specialized cells. So some cells do one odor, some cells do another, et cetera. As far as we know, this decision of what cell senses what odor, it's actually made completely randomly. It's an example of something that we call noise. But what the heck is noise? Well, obviously, in this context, it means something a little bit different. Noise is the variability in behavior that we see among genetically identical cells. You should think of that like. Identical twins. You know that they have the same genes. You don't expect them to behave the same way, right? Noise is just saying that the cells in your body act that way also. I can look at two cells that are right next to each other inside my nose, and they don't have to behave the same way. But I guess the problem with calling it noise is that it sounds like something bad, right? Or at least something that we don't understand. So that was the big question that I had going into my PhD. Is it really all just random, or are there patterns that we're missing? Because we're looking from the wrong perspective. But working long term on my nose seemed like a bit of a difficult proposition. I needed something simpler, and I ended up picking bacteria. So let me show you why. We're going to conduct a simple experiment right here. We're just going to put these bacteria on a food source and watch what they do by microscopy. What we'll see is just like those cells in the nose, these bacteria randomly change what they do. So you see that? That's noise. That's genetically identical cells behaving differently. But why? Unfortunately, this experiment isn't a very good way to address that question. The basic problem is that it's completely unreproducible. I'm going to do the same experiment three different times, and I'll get three completely different answers. If we want to find patterns in noise, it's going to be hard if we're looking at something like that. In fact, if we want to find patterns, what we really want to do is watch cells make the same decision. Over and over and over and over again, exactly the same conditions. And that's where my collaborators and I enter into this story. We used a technique called microfluidics, which let us engineer thousands of tiny traps in which we can capture individual cells. These traps are basically sensory deprivation chambers for cells. So, to the cells inside, nothing around them ever changes. And we can basically just park them in there and watch them indefinitely. The end result looks something like this thousands of bacteria inside thousands of individual traps, thousands of decisions made in exactly the same conditions. But we're looking for patterns. So, are there any? Well, perhaps from looking at this video, you'd think that it looks a bit random. And that's actually true. At this scale, some of the behavior that we see is just random. These bacteria are randomly switching back and forth between two different activities. But what I, want, what I want to emphasize is that random doesn't have to mean useless. In this case, we think they're actually doing it this way on purpose. Switching randomly like this is just like those cells in the nose. It, just, it lets different bacteria specialize in different tasks. It's really just division of labor. But of course, if we look in the right places, our new perspective does reveal a hidden order. And these are my favorite bacteria, because these ones actually coordinate their behavior. Once one bacterium decides to change what it's doing, eight generations of its progeny are carried along with it. That's like you obeying an order from your great, 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 great grandmother. Not too bad for bacteria, right? And don't forget that we actually have thousands of these decisions to look at. So these are processes that we can start to understand statistically. I can write down mathematical rules and formulas that explain why these cells behave the way they do. How cells make decisions is actually something that we can understand quantitatively from the bottom up.、And、maybe you think that's neat, but why is it important? 
Well, the type of variability that I'm talking about doesn't just explain why some cells appear to change color in a movie. It can address some of our most important questions. It can explain why some bacteria resist our antibiotics, even when the rest of their genetically identical brethren are killed off. It can explain why some cancer cells uh, respond differently to our treatments. The basic lesson that noise is giving us is that those cells outwardly look the same to us. They behave like individuals. What understanding what makes cells different then, rather than what makes them the same, can give us a new perspective on some of our most important problems. Perhaps, if we're lucky, we'll see a pattern in the noise. Thank you. Wow, what an incredible opportunity it is to share with you some of my work today. First, I would like to ask, how many of you in here have taken aspirin before? Just raise your hand. That's kind of what I expected. You see, as a young child growing up in the Caribbean, aspirin was also no stranger to our home. In fact, it was my mother's go-to drug. Just think about it. We use aspirin for the treatment of pain, fever, inflammatory illnesses, and for the prevention of heart attacks and strokes. It really is an amazing drug. But that's not all. Did you know that aspirin might be useful in cancer? A recent study identified a potentially new benefit for the use of this drug in colon cancer. Specifically, Aspirin seems to benefit those colon cancer patients who have a certain mutation in a gene called PIK3CA. Here's what they found. This graph shows that patients with this mutation who also take aspirin are less likely to suffer from cancer-related death compared to those who do not. This finding is significant as it suggests that aspirin could potentially be useful in the treatment of cancer. Of course, this study alone is not enough, and more research still needs to be done to support this theory. What is even more exciting is the implications of this finding in the treatment of breast cancer. Why, you may ask? Because these mutations are found in about 30% of all breast cancers. Before I go on, let me tell you a little more about this mutant PIK3CA gene and its relevance to breast cancer. Our lab and others have observed that if you add this mutant gene to a normal, non-cancerous breast cell, this cell will now begin to show some of the characteristics of a tumor cell. For example, these mutant cells are able to grow faster compared to the normal cells, even under conditions where major growth factors are absent. This mutant gene can also cause a change in the gene expression of that cell. Many of the affected genes are involved in processes like inflammation, cell movement, cell death, and cell growth, among others. And notably, this mutation has also been shown to promote the development of breast tumors in mice. So the important question is this. Does aspirin have a chemotherapeutic benefit in treating breast cancers with this mutant gene? To begin to answer this question, we use PIK3CA mutant cells that were originally derived from a breast cancer patient. These cells were treated with different doses of aspirin, and the effect of the drug on the growth of the cells was assessed. What we found is that as we increased the amount of aspirin, the number of breast cancer cells decreased. We also wanted to find out whether lower doses of aspirin could improve the effectiveness of a second drug. This drug was designed to block the activity of PIK3CA. We want to know the answer to this question because many of these drugs, which are currently used in clinical trials, 
have yet to reach their maximum level of effectiveness. Many have severe side effects, and often the tumors develop resistance to these drugs. We observe that lower doses of aspirin or this PIK3CA inhibitor drug alone had minimal effect. However, when we combine the two, they cause a more significant decrease in the number of breast cancer cells. This trend holds true not only for this specific drug, but also for a second drug which can block the activity of PIK3CA. Intrigued by these findings, we then performed several experiments to try to understand how aspirin works in the context of a mutant PIK3CA cell. So far, we have learned that mutant PIK3CA can increase the activity of proteins involved in processes like cell growth, survival, metabolism, as well as proteins that can affect processes like cell movement, inflammation, and blood vessel development. All of these processes have been shown to play a critical role in the growth and spread of cancer. Importantly, we have also learned that aspirin can block the activity of many of those mutant PIK3CA regulated proteins. And this may explain in part why it might have this beneficial effect. Now, what I have shared with you today is only a tip of the iceberg, and more research still needs to be done using animal models and in human, human clinical trials. However, just the thought that something as simple and inexpensive like aspirin could someday be part of our standard treatment for breast cancer is indeed an exciting prospect. Thank you. Great to be here. We've heard a lot about the future, but for the next five minutes, I invite you to travel with me back 4,000 years ago to the ancient Assyrian past, here in the Bronze Age, 2000 BCE. And together, we'll discover a society once lost to us, and there remains the cuneiform texts that reconnect each of us to this big data through social networks. The story begins when I was just a boy. I was raised in a strict Orthodox religion, and from as early as I can remember, my mind was keenly aware of the great and terrible questions of life. Where did we come from? Why are we here? Where are we going? And what is the meaning of life? So in my search for meaning, I did what any good Harvard student would do, and I hit the books. In my case, this meant reading the earliest books known to mankind, the cuneiform tablets from Mesopotamia. There are over a half million cuneiform tablets dispersed throughout the world's museums, such as these 5,000 housed in Harvard's own Semitic Museum. And yet all of these tablets are just a fraction of what still remains buried in the ground and forgotten for over 4,000 years. Think of that, the equivalent of the Library of Alexandria, or perhaps Widener own, Widener's Library, buried in the ground and forgotten. Texts ranging from genres that we enjoy today, from the earliest economic and mathematics texts, to the great works of literature, law, and philosophy. In the course of my study, I was invited to Copenhagen, Denmark, by the Old Assyrian Text Project, in order to study a unique group of texts called the Old Assyrian Caravan Texts. Over 23,000 tablets were discovered at the archeological site of Kultepe, Turkey, ancient Kanesh. These texts are the remnants of the businessmen and venture capitalists of the Bronze Age trade. Much like we would expect to find in the email archives of Wall Street CEOs, these texts are the contracts, receipts, and letters between fathers and sons, husbands and wives, rulers and slaves, but ultimately business partners. 
all writing back and forth to one another in a highly literate society. However, with this high degree of literacy comes one major obstacle for scholars in this field to tackle, and that is paponymy. The naming of a child after his papa or grandfather, which in this case is hyperactive at this time. In essence, there are too many Tom, Dick, and Harrys to make sense of who's who in the archive. So it's been incredibly difficult to detail the archive of a single merchant, let alone then to, to include this merchant's archive into the interconnected web of the social society in Assyria. To overcome this problem, I collaborated with a talented computer scientist from Carnegie Mellon named David Bamman, and together, we developed a probabilistic latent variable statistical model that reconstructs the internal hierarchy of these texts and the merchants therein on the basis of 2,000 old Assyrian letters. I then combined this data with a total of 5,000 old Assyrian tablets into a graphical database, which depicts the names of these merchants and the relationships to one another as nodes and edges. The results of this work have been absolutely amazing. All at once, we can see the overall scope of the, the structure and organization of the old Assyrian network in all its complexity and with a life all its own. Essentially, a Facebook for ancient Assyria. In a single glance, we can pinpoint the major robust actors at this time and notice their lesser known wives who would otherwise, otherwise seldom make history. For me, this means I finally have a solution to the problem of paponymy and I can begin to accurately reconstruct this old Assyrian society and its social network. For scholars, Future, in, in future fields and scholars, this means that we now have a way of accessing an otherwise inaccessible group of texts through a structure and an organization. So now what did I find in my search for the meaning of life? That we are all connected in this giant web of social networks, linking us to the ancient Assyrians over 4,000 years ago in essentially the same structures that we uh, come together in today, that despite the many ways we each feel isolated and divided into tribes, we are all inherently connected to the same great social networks of humanity. Thank you. Thank you. Growing up, I learned an important lesson from G.I. Joe. <laughs> knowing is half the battle. <laughs> In medicine, knowing is diagnosis. We use diagnostic tests to know if we have a disease. I want to tell you about our work to create a rapid diagnostic test for sickle cell disease. And In sickle cell disease, knowing can be more than half the battle. Some of you may be familiar with this disease. It's also called sickle cell anemia. It's a genetic disorder that causes red blood cells to deform, and they create a sickle shape. These sickle cells can cause pain, increase the risk for infection, and can cause stroke. In the US, one of every 100 kids born with sickle cell disease dies before the age of five. In sub-Saharan Africa, 50 to 90 of those kids would die from sickle cell disease. This is unacceptable. Simple interventions exist that can save most of these kids. But to treat them, we need a diagnosis. Antibiotics, folate, hydration can all make a difference, but we need to know that there's a disease there first. When I was a Peace Corps volunteer in South Africa, I saw people needlessly suffering because they didn't have access to affordable diagnostics. I decided to try to use my research 
to create technology that can try to reach these people. In the US, every child is screened for sickle cell disease using centralized laboratories filled with expensive equipment and trained personnel. These luxuries don't exist in rural clinics in Africa or even in many hospitals in the developing world. So how do we reach these places? How do we create a different type of technology? We had to rethink how we create devices for diagnostics. We went back to the basics and tried to think about the simplest way to measure a difference between someone with sickle cell disease and someone without it. I told you that there's a difference in the shape of the cells. There's also a difference in density. The sickle cells are much more dense than normal cells. And so if we could separate them, we could maybe identify that they're there. But how do we separate cells by density? If you ever drop something while you're in the bathtub, you know the answer. It either sinks or it floats. The water let you separate the objects by density. When we mix polymers in water, they separate just like oil and water separate and make multiple layers. Each layer allows us to separate objects by density. We designed one of these systems to separate the dense sickle cells from the rest of the blood. And here's everything we need to run our test. We put the polymers into a tube the size of a toothpick, then add a drop of blood, seal the tube, and add it to a centrifuge. We can then spin it for about 10 minutes. During this time, normal shaped cells would pass through the top layer and get stuck at the interface. Only the dense sickle cells can pass through the bottom and make a layer. The result, a rapid test that you can read by eye. By looking for a red band at the bottom of the tube, you can tell if someone has sickle cell disease or doesn't. It takes about 10 minutes and the cost per test is 50 cents. Now, we showed that this worked in Harvard, that's great, but that wasn't our original problem. We were trying to create something that would work in rural clinics in Africa. Fortunately, everything I showed you fits in a backpack. So I packed it all up and I went to Zambia. There we worked with a hospital to test our device on more patients. We also went out to rural clinics. We talked with community health workers and nurses and had them try using our test. It's not enough for a test to be simple in its concept and idea. It has to be simple to use. It has to be so simple that anyone can use it. So working with our partners in Zambia, we found ways to improve our test. And we're now working on the next generation of our rapid test for sickle cell disease. We can do more than just sickle cell disease. Using density, we're creating rapid tests to differentiate different types of anemia and also to do white blood cell counts. These are the kind of tests that aren't just going to be useful in a clinic in rural Africa. They could be helpful here in a clinic in Boston, saving you time and money with doctors. We still have a way to go before we have a product on the shelf, but in just three years, we've come incredibly far. From an idea to clinical trials in Africa, from equipment that fits in the big central laboratory to technology in a backpack. As researchers, we often embrace complexity. Sometimes solutions come from combining our understanding with simplicity. Thank you. alone in the universe? Scientists, philosophers, ethicists, cavemen, and women have pondered this for a millennium. Back in the 1960s, we started SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and there was great optimism that within a few decades we would have unambiguous evidence of intelligent life. But the radios have been silent. There's been no hello earthlings call from the cosmos. 
However, life doesn't need to be technological for us to detect it, and today I want to take you on a journey of how we're pushing the boundaries of technology in order to actively pursue the answer to this question. I would like to start with an image taken by Voyager. Voyager is the farthest probe we have sent into space, and just after it crossed the orbit of Pluto, it turned back and snapped this picture in 1990. That's it. That's us. All of Earth reduced to one pixel, Carl Sagan's famous pale blue dot. I just love this image. It provides us a glimpse as to what our planet would look like to an alien astronomer. And she could tell that life was on our planet because in Earth's reflected light, she would see signatures of oxygen and methane. These gases are produced by microbial life and wouldn't exist together in combination around a lifeless world. This is because without a constant and high flux of both gases from biology, oxygen and oxidizing gas would quickly destroy methane, a reducing gas. Geology alone won't produce high concentrations of these gases in a Sun-Earth analog. Thus, it is the combination of an oxidizing and a reducing gas together that constitute a strong biosignature or an indicator of life. And it's our best hope for finding life outside our solar system. The idea that we could do this for planets around other stars fascinates me. And so in my research, I model how these biosignatures change depending on the host star's temperature. We know what Earth looks like around our sun, but what would it look like around another star? Stars come in many sizes with larger stars being hotter and smaller stars being cooler. Around a larger star, there is more high energy UV radiation. And this high energy light breaks apart, destroying some biomolecules like methane. But the same high energy light fosters the reactions that form others, such as ozone. And ozone is used as a proxy for oxygen since it's easier to detect. The second step of what I do is to simulate what we would then see from Earth with a telescope. This step is important since just because some biosignatures are more abundant in an atmosphere does not mean they are easier to detect. To give you an idea of what we're hoping to see for other terrestrial planets around other stars, here are the spectra for three planets in our own solar system that have very different signatures, Earth, Venus, and Mars. I want you to think of a spectrum as basically a light fingerprint. And just as fingerprints are unique to each human, Light interacts in very predictable ways with the molecules in an atmosphere, creating its own molecular fingerprint. But trying to detect the light from these planets is no easy feat. A star outshines its planet by over a factor of one billion. That means for every billion photons we get from the star, we get just one from an Earth-like planet. It's a bit like trying to find a firefly while staring directly into a spotlight. It seems to be an impossible task. And imagine that that spotlight is in California and you're observing from Massachusetts. That's what we're trying to do. Remarkably, though, astronomers are near to doing just that. And in the next decade, we're building some of the largest telescopes so far that should have the capacity to detect biosignatures around the closest planets outside of our solar system. And that's where my thesis of modeling the detectability of these biosignatures fits in. When building a multi-billion dollar telescope, it's vital to ensure that we're looking at the correct wavelengths or colors of light, that we're observing long enough to gather as much light as possible, and at high enough resolution to tease out these spectral fingerprints. What drives me every day is the prospect that in our lifetimes, we will be able to have signs of life on another planet. The universe is incredibly vast. We expect there to be 40 billion Earth-like planets in our galaxy alone. And there are billions and billions of galaxies. However, so far we have only one example of a planet with life so far. Ultimately, we want to discover, is life a cosmic imperative, popping up on every habitable planet in the universe, or is it exceedingly rare, arising only under the strictest of conditions? We just don't know. But for the first time in human history, we have the scientific capability to start to answer this question.
And either answer will have far-reaching consequences in our society from philosophy to science. Are we the last generation of lonely earthlings? I hope so. Thank you. I'm un unsure if we are alone in the universe, but I'm absolutely sure there are no Harvard Horizon scholars on any other planet. <laughs> it is now the time to give our scholars a scientific evaluation of their presentations. So I want, to hear, I want you to hear my instruction carefully since it's scientific. I want each of you to plot n times where n is the score you give to them from scale of 0 to 100, 100 being perfect. Are you ready? Go. Stand up. Stand up. Thank you very much. Some of you did not hear my instruction clearly. You exceed 100 times. In my opening remarks, I deliberately left out two key, pe two key people to thank so that I could thank them now with a more adequate amount of time. My dear friend and classmate, Stephen Blythe, is one of the two. Stephen's generous donation to establish the Dean's Innovation Fund makes Harvard Horizon possible financially from supporting the training of the scholars to the reception you're about to enjoy. Most importantly, however, Stephen himself exemplified the critical importance of effective communication skill, as he is a leader both on Wall Street as well as in the classroom, having won the prestigious Phi Beta Kappa Teaching Prize last year and being named the favorite professor of the class of 2011. It therefore gives me great pleasure to invite Steve to kick off the closing ceremony. Steve. So thank you for the introduction and thank you all so much for coming. I'm, I'm so delighted to be able to support this event, Harvard Horizons 2, HH2, and showcase the uh, remarkable talent of, of our graduate students. As, as Zhao Li mentioned, he and I were actually classmates together uh, at GSAS uh, several years ago. Uh, we actually wrote a, a paper together back in those days. and. Uh, is actually a good indication of our respective academic trajectories that that paper we wrote together is still my most cited paper, and it is Zhao Li's 28th most cited paper. <laughs> I guess that's why he's the dean. Um, so we have, we have uh, taken different routes from when we were PhD students together in the, in the Science Center until we came back together at Harvard eight years ago, and since we've been back, we have spoken a lot about the importance of communication and in particular the importance of our graduate students being able to convey complex ideas in a clear, coherent, compelling, consistent, alliterative uh, way. <laughs> and that's why I'm so delighted that Harvard Horizons took off both with Zhao Li's vision but also Kuriyama-san uh, last year. It's been a really tremendous event on the, on the Harvard calendar. Communication skill obviously is really important in academia is also important for careers outside the academy where clearly one's effectiveness in one's career is often linked to the ability to articulate complex ideas to colleagues or investors or, or one's boss. And uh, that's why I, I love this event where we've seen the talent of our students and their ability to communicate these, these complicated ideas. Firms which hire Harvard PhDs want them to De develop groundbreaking ideas. No one wants a Harvard PhD to dumb down their ideas just so they can communicate it well. Right? They, but they do want the ability to articulate and engage, and you've seen eight incredible examples of that today. I would say in my own career, I've seen many very, very smart PhD graduates flounder 
outside the academy, sunk really by the, the inability to communicate uh, their subtle and uh, complex ideas. So anyway, I want to thank you all for, for coming again. I would urge you, I hope to see you all back here next year for HH3. It's a great event. Um, we are now going to hand out some certificates and prizes, and I hope all of you will join us downstairs for some beers and to uh, celebrate the Harvard Horizon Scholars of 2014. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. The other person I have left out is my boss, Mike Smith, the Dean of Arts, the, the Dean of Faculty of Arts and Sciences. A common wisdom suggests that effective communication with one's boss should always include some expressions of gratitude. <laughs> but I want to sincerely thank Mike, not because of this common wisdom, but rather because of his, his strong support to the Harvard Horizon program, including sharing his personal speech coach with the Horizon Scholars. And she's really terrific, as I learned myself. In fact, I will let you guess what particular skill that I'm using right now that I learned from her. I'm therefore particularly pleased that Dean Smith is here to give his reflections on the Harvard Horizon program and to present the Horizon certificates to the scholars. Let's welcome Dean Smith. Thank you, Xiaoli, and uh, welcome everyone. I will be uh, short here. First of all, let me say a few thanks to first uh, Hisa for his vision, and for Stephen for his visionary support, and then of course to Xiaoli for his incredible leadership of this important program. I'm sure we can say without a doubt that you have changed lives with this program, so thank you very much. And then finally, a thanks to all of our Horizon Scholars. Uh, you may be the second class through this, but it certainly rang true today that you were first class in all your presentations, so thank you very much for that. I thought I would just say a few words about a couple of them here. Uh, Adam, it was unbelievable to learn about these Assyrian texts and the interconnectivity of the networks back in our past. Now, if you could identify the Zuckerberg from back there, I know during this campaign our development officers would love to talk to their family. <laughs> Uh, and Heather, it was just fantastic to learn about life so different from our own around these hydrothermal vents on the seafloor. But if you're looking for life without light, you don't have to go two hours down in the ocean. My son's room, easy. We can get you right there real quick. Uh, and then David, we, we need to talk. If you can block pains in particular parts of my body before he enters my office, we got, we got a real, we got something real for you here, I'm telling you. So anyway, I hope you all thought as we went through this that uh, you thought about things differently. You started to see the world in a different way. I certainly did. I was delighted by today's uh, performances, today's presentations, and that's really the point, as you heard from some of the speeches earlier. We live in an information age. The world moves forward because of the discovery, dissemination, not just dissemination, but dissemination with true understanding, and then the application, as you heard in some of today's presentations, of new knowledge to address issues that we have in the world today. Harvard Horizons is certainly preparing scholars for this important work. We have all just seen the power of incredibly crisp communication, how it can capture our imagination, and how it can open up new ways of thinking. And with this effective, compelling communication, we can also build community. Isolated scholars sitting alone in a study carol or a laboratory or even on a mountaintop is not the goal. The goal is that new knowledge comes forth best when we get people together and together they rally around new ideas, as a computer scientist myself, I believe strongly in the power of networks. It allows us to take the spark of an idea that occurs in one brain and unlock the power of many brains. That's certainly what we've seen today. I hope you enjoyed today's program. 
I want to again say thank you to our scholars and congratulations. And we'll move, invite Shali and Hisa back up here to the presentation of the certificates. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I will lead, uh, read the, uh, the names of, of our uh, speakers and invite them to come up individually. Uh, David Roberson. <laughs> Heather Owens. <laughs> Danny Orbach. Thomas Norman. <laughs> Whitney Henry. Adam Anderson. AJ Kumar. Sarah McGregor Rogheimer. Now I'd like to invite David and Heather to uh, representing the scholars. Thank you all again for coming tonight. We really all feel so lucky to be here. It's great to get our five minutes with you all, but we also really want to emphasize how much of a team effort most of our uh, research is. So could we have all of our advisors, lab or group members, um, and anyone else who has collaborated on any of the projects we talked about, could you all please stand up? Come on. There we go. Thank you all so much. We, we really couldn't have done it without you. Um, so I think it's safe to say that all of us got more out of this experience than we expected. For the last few months, we've really been wrestling with how to condense the details that represent blood, sweat, and tears of like five years of our life into five minutes. Um, and so how do you create a compelling and entertaining story without oversimplifying and staying true to the complexities of your research? Harvard Horizons provided us with the structure to simultaneously focus on content, visuals, vocal and physical communication, and an amazing support team to help us in all of those areas. Additionally, simply by bringing us together, the Horizons experience has provided us with an amazing opportunity to discuss our work with scholars from very different disciplines. This is something that doesn't necessarily happen all that, that, all that often around here, uh, and it has enabled each of us to see our own projects in a very different light. It really has been a wonderful journey, so thank you again for coming and letting us share it with you. So one of the best parts of this experience, which was unexpected for me, and I think most of uh, the other scholars up here, was just the, the opportunity to meet on a regular basis with people who are serious about what they do, but whose background and whose research is totally unrelated to what you're doing. And so it's uh, this, this opportunity to meet, both formally, but even more so informally after our, our training sessions has just been just fabulous. And, and so I want to thank all of the, the people involved in, in putting this together for that um, great, uh, unexpected jewel. Uh, so I also want to have some uh, specific thank yous. Um, so Marlon Kuzmik and the Box Center media team, um, I want to thank you so much. They were instrumental in putting together the uh, visual and, and, and just uh, the, the visual appeal of the presentations and, and the flow of things. And so thank you.
And we have several, co several others who uh, have coached us, um, Ellen Cates and Sarah Jessup in particular. Thank you. And of course, um, Dean Gill and Ming and all of those who uh, played a role in putting this together and making it happen. Thank you. And the GSAS uh, support staff and others who uh, really just made all the loose ends tie together. Uh, thank you so much. And we have three final people that we have uh, some plaques for that were uh, met with this on, on a weekly basis. Um, Laura Fromm, Pamela Pollock, and Professor uh, Hisa Kuriyama, would you please come up? These plaques have our handwritten notes uh, or thank yous on them. So. <laughs> thank you. Now I'm really jealous. <laughs> we have just had a great deal of food for thought, from how to disobey your boss without getting executed or fired, to the possibility of finding parking space on another earth. And now it's time for the food for stomach. But before I invite everyone to the Queen's Head Club, a pub, let me invite more students to apply next year more faculty to serve on the selection committee, and more alum to contribute. And of course, I thank all of you for being here today, and I promise I will quote the eighth fan letter I received tomorrow during my opening remarks next year. See you next year. Let's all go to Queen's Head.